Hey, welcome to Advancing AI, where we talk all things AI and machine learning. If you're new around here, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Today, we're diving into 13 different ways to write clean code. Now, this might not sound very exciting, but trust me, it's the secret sauce behind every successful AI or machine learning project. Now, you can think of clean code like having a really well-organized kitchen where everything is in its own place and you know exactly what you need to do to create a successful dish. Now, if you had a chaotic kitchen where you can't even find your spoon or utensil that you need, it's going to be a disaster. So clean code is very much like having a really well-oiled, organized kitchen. Now, we're thrilled to have Sati back talking to us about the blog that Daniel from Databricks has authored and it's all about 13 essential tips of writing clean code back into our platform. And we'll have her with us in a moment. But in the meantime, grab a drink, sit back, and let's jump right in. Hey, Sapi, welcome back. It's nice to see you again. How are you doing? Hi, Gabby. Thank you for having me back. I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm honestly very excited to talk about a new blog that's just been released, which talks about 13 essential tips for writing clean code, right? So that's super, super, super important in terms of making sure your code is neat, it's factored well, and it all feeds into the entire MLOps cycle. And I was just wondering whether you can start off by giving us, why is it giving us kind of a description or the reason as to why is it so important, whether you're AI or you're machine learning developer, right? Why is it so important to make sure you're writing clean code in data? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'd like to remind your audience that we are talking in the context of MLOps Gym, where we have three stages, crawl, walk, and run. Um, so in each of these stages, we're helping you understand how you can progress to the next stage. Now, when you're starting working as a ML pra practitioner on data breaks in the context of MLOps, probably you're writing your code, you're copying stuff over, you're experimenting in a notebook. But then in order to move to the next stage, you have to think about how you can automate some of this, right? It could yeah. be notebook automation, or you can later on create projects out of your code. But in order to do those things, you need to get your code in a state that it is clean. It is actually, it runs without errors. Uh, it, it's automatable, if that's a word. Uh, so yeah, that, that is why you need to remove all the extra bits yep. that wouldn't, yep. would, wouldn't work in a production environment or in an automated way. I mean, that's great, right? So you're going to tell us in 13 different ways how to write clean code, is that right? Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Brilliant. Go for it, Sabi. Yeah, this blog post is written by one of my colleagues, Daniel, and I have the honor of actually talking about it. So the first step is that, did you know that we have a built-in black formatter? So black, you know, it's a very uh, popular formatter. I've, always, I've used it for many, many years. And on Databricks, this is there for you. Uh, so you, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. You can basically select uh, your code and then you can do Command, Shift and F. If you're working uh, on, on a Mac, you can see it just formatted right away. Or you can go to uh, your edit and, uh, sorry, to um, yeah, edit and uh, format cells. So it does the same thing. Yeah. So in these two places, you can, you can find this option. And that yep. is tip number one for you use it and use it often. Brilliant. And what's tip number two then? Um, so the uh, tip number two is that uh, whenever you're working in a notebook, just don't leave it like that. You have to back it up. It's actually, it's a very basic uh, development principle. Always back your code because if you don't back it, you're going to lose it at some point. Now, on uh, Databricks, uh, you can back up anything that you do with Git or any other um, uh, provider, version control provider that you, can, you have. There are, um, you can do it in a few different places. Uh, for example, the first way you can do it, you can go to your repos and you can basically go and create a repo. This allows you to, to, to clone your repository and do all the things that you do usually when you work with Git, right? To clone, to um, pull, push, and so on. Yeah. Uh, you can also do this from the workspace directly. This is uh, added recently. So you can go ahead and again, uh, you can go and create a Git folder, similar to what you saw in the repos. Uh, there isn't really um, um, a preference, at least for me, just 
do it as you like. Just different ways. Now, I don't think you are able to create Git folders on Workspace. Is that right? Is that a new addition? Yeah, yeah. This was this was popular demand, so <laughs> we added nice. those. Nice. Nice. So that's it. That was uh, so. The the other thing that I would like to talk about in this context is that usually when you have notebooks and you check them uh, to Git, there are a um, actually three different ways to do it or three different formats that you can have your notebook in. The first one is Databricks uh, notebook. So yep. this is a uh, file type. It's called source or .py. The other one is you can have it as a IPython notebook. Uh, without your outputs, because by default, if you're uh, pushing your um, notebook in an IPython format, uh, it will um, it won't uh, capture the outputs. No. So it will go without output. Or there's another way to do it uh, with outputs. Uh, you can find tips on how to do that to set that up in the blog post. I'm not going to go through that, but there are these three different options. Our recommendation is that go with IPython notebooks. Uh, without output because it's nicer. You can kind of see it in different places. You can read it easily in the yeah. kitchen bowl as well. Yeah. Cool. Very good. That's tip number two. Now, tip number three is uh, leverage an IDE if you want to do uh, more extensive development, for example, if you want to do debugging, uh, because local IDEs, they have functionalities that are uh, more more sophisticated in terms of debugging. We have added debugging as well to Databricks, but I mean, if you are, for example, familiar with VS Code or PyCharm and so on, it is much easier to do it there. Now uh, you can. There are we have different ways to integrate uh, IDEs with Databricks. Uh, we have extensive documentation on that, so check them out. Uh, you can don't think that okay on Databricks you can only work with notebooks. That's not true. Uh, we have lots of users that use IDEs uh, because they prefer those. Now, tip number four, and this is a very important one, is that once you have cleaned up your notebook, you have to be able to do clear state and run all. Yep. Okay, so your notebook needs to be running end to end before you put it into production yep. <laughs> without any manual steps. That's it. Um, and that is different than actually going and running your cells one by one. Yep. Uh, so there might be some dependencies that like you have to clear everything. There might be some cache. So yeah. you have to clear and run off. That's yeah, so it's good, it's good practice if, as you're developing to make sure that you're clearing all, all outputs and running it all, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Good stuff. Now, uh, tip number five. Uh, you need to capture your runtime, your cluster config, and notebook uh, uses, OK? OK. Um, I'm going to share the blog, actually. Uh, so in order to, why do you need to capture the DBR version? Well, when you are automating your notebook, you need to create a cluster to run that, a jobs cluster. And for that, you need the DBR version because each DBR version comes with different de dependencies, different packages on it, different versions of each package. So you need to know the exact one that you use for development. Yeah. And here in the blog post, I'm showing you, there's, there are a different, couple of different ways that you can capture that and you can save it. Yeah, and it's similar to, I guess, if you're used to developing in VS Code and you've got Python packages, it's, it's equivalent to your requirements files, right? And making sure everything is detailed so you know exactly what package is associated to the program that you're running. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, in order to capture all the Python packages that you're using in your uh, with your code in your notebook, you can do a pip freeze. So this is how you can see everything, all the versions of everything that you have. Um, the uh, And once you have captured all of these, uh, you can actually create a requirement file that you can later on when you're automating your notebook, you can use it to install it. Yeah. Cool. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you when it comes to ca capturing the dependencies is uh, how you can do it uh, within, the, within the notebook. So. Uh, in the notebook, if you go to, the, uh, to this tab, to the libraries tab here, you can see that there's like a bunch of libraries. Now, uh, there are actually three different types of libraries that, uh, like in general in Databricks, you can have, right? Uh, the ones that you install in your notebook, which are notebook scope, and then you have some that you can install directly on the cluster uh, when you're starting up the cluster, and then you can have the runtime ones that they come by default from runtime. And here is where you can find out which libraries are 
installed in the notebook or in the cluster or the runtime uh, if you want to kind of capture that information. Interesting. Yes, and that was tip number five. So what's uh, tip number six then, Sepi? So the tip number six is short and sweet. You have to know at the input and output of your notebook. Know where you're reading. I mean, it, it sounds very easy, but sometimes you develop for such a long time that at some point, you just know the data frame, you forget about the, the source. It could be somewhere that is not accessible to your automated job. So that is important to know. And also uh, do save your results somewhere that is accessible by the automated job that you're gonna create later on. Perfect. So you can write it back down to, to, to your Hive table. Would that be sufficient? And with your input? Now, is there any kind of top tips in terms of how you track your inputs? Uh, well, yes. So um, if you're using MLflow, for example, your inputs are being captured by MLflow. Uh, I personally use MLflow for tracking everything because that's my favorite thing in the world. Like, yeah. I have this one okay. on MLflow. Yeah. Right. yeah, use MLflow. Okay. So what have you got for tip number seven there, Sabi? So tip number seven is very important, especially if you're a beginner, because uh, it's not something that is so obvious. You know, uh, when you're developing in a notebook, usually you want to have a look at your data and you want to see, okay, how it looks like, that the transformation to do what I wanted it to do. And usually you use like display or print statements. Some of these statements could be really, really expensive. For example, display. Yeah. The reason is that um, Spark has so-called lazy execution. So when you're writing transformation, it actually doesn't execute it on yes. the data. But if you have actions such as display, it goes and takes the data and actually executes all the transformation that you described. Uh, that's why you don't need display in an automa automated format. Because like if you're running a job, like you don't display something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, if, you, if there's something that you need to capture, you can always log it using a logging module instead of having a display or print statement. Yep, makes sense, yep. And what's tip number eight? Tip number eight is actually one of those that takes you from uh, one level to the next. So uh, when you're a beginner, maybe you don't think about testing your code so much, but eventually if you wanna be a pro and if you wanna um, do uh, development with higher quality, you will need to have tests. And this is the first step in that direction. So we recommend if it is possible to have a cert uh, statement in your code. Uh, so for example, if you're doing feature engineering and you do some transformation and you're expecting to create this number of columns. So yeah. what is assert a statement that kind of checks that? And later on, you can actually take these and use them for unit testing when you're yeah. developing exactly. your project. Yeah. Okay, so what have we got for tip nine? Tip nine is, uh, you know, when you're developing, you're trying different things, some of them work, and then you decide to continue down that route, but some, Maybe they don't, they don't work or you don't need them anymore, but you forget them and they're there. So make sure all the cells that you have in your notebook actually are needed. So they're not something that you just tried, didn't work, but you forgot to remove because that could be expensive. That could yeah. potentially be, a, be some wasted compute for you. Yeah, absolutely. And we all are, are guilty of that, right? We all do that pretty often. So that is honestly one of the best tips that I've taken away to make sure that every code at the end of it is actually going to be fed into a production cycle. Yes, cool. definitely. Uh, tip number 10, uh, we actually very cheekily, we have just touched upon this without going into details because it's a very big topic. Um, when you're running your notebook, in each cell, you can see the, the execution time. Yeah. Now, if it's important to note if there, there are some cells that they take much longer than the other, then that's how you know, okay, this part of my code might be optimizable. So yeah. you can go and spend some more time and try to understand whether it's as optim op optimized as possible. Now we don't get into the details of this because you know, Spark optimization, there's been like books written about it. So there isn't time for it here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tip number 11, uh, remove any line or cell magics. You know, in, uh, in the notebooks, you have these magic statements like percent %fs or percent %sh yes. for running, for example, shell uh, commands and so on. You have to convert these into Python code, for example, yeah. if you have a Python notebook. The reason is that if later on you run it as a script, uh, yeah. 
the percentage is not so the magic is not going to work. And uh, for this, you can use uh, things like uh, dbutils. So dbutils has many of these functionalities. Also, the other thing is that you might have some SQL code with yep. percent SQL that you can use. You can convert it to PySpark that SQL yes. and PySpark. Yeah, makes sense. Um, tip number 12, remove any hard-coded variable, right? You don't want to hard-code stuff. Uh, if, if they are absolutely required, move them to the top of your notebook so it's easily accessible and try to capitalize it. That's uh, so we know that it's a hard-coded variable. Yeah. And tip number 13, last but not least. Our last tip, yes. Yes, yes, we got there finally. Remove any repetitive code. Have a read through your code and see if there are there is anything that you can convert into a function. If it's called more than once, then you have you have to have a function. So don't don't repeat yeah. code. This is the basic best practice in software development. Uh, so that is our last tip. Now now that cleaned up your notebook, uh, you can convert it into a repeatable workflow or a job. Uh, you can actually go ahead and just schedule it as a job. It's quite easy. Uh, we have, you can do it in the UI. You can use um, our API or one of our SDKs, or if you fancy Terraform, you can do it. Um, our CLI has this functionality as yeah. well. Uh, so yeah, basically your code is ready to go. You can, you can use it. All right. I mean, that's fantastic, Sapi. That's 13 amazing, cool ways in terms of you know, how to really write clean code. And a lot of us take it for granted. So thank you for, for taking the time to come and talk to us, to remind us about having these good practices when you're writing code to make sure they're clean, refactored, ready to be in within the ML up cycle for production. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, if you like to see more videos like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, if you're using any of these effective ways already in terms of developing your clean code, that's great, great news. But if you're not, then um, please, by all means, add up this wonderful 13 ways of making sure you're writing clean code. And if you're using more ways than what we've already discussed here, we would love to hear from you. So please put it in the comments and we will definitely be responding and sharing the community as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Sadie.